namo atasa bhagavato arahato asamma sambuddhasa namo atasa bhagavato arahato asamma sambuddhasa namo atasa bhagavato arahato asamma sambuddhasa bhutang dhammang sankang namasami Good evening. I thought this evening I would give some uh, reflections on the theme of impermanence and change and death. And, uh, probably all noticed earlier it was a very glorious sunny day and now we have a, a summer storm. Change is occurring all the time. This is nature. But in Buddhist training, uh, we train ourselves to pay a closer attention to this. Because latent in the mind, there is a grasping at things as being permanent and a craving for things to be permanent. And we understand that by contemplating impermanence, we weaken our attachment, uh, we weaken our delusion. So the Buddha praised contemplating impermanence, he recommended it. And uh, I just thought I'd give a little bit of reflections about some of the ways that I've been contemplating impermanence lately in my life. And, uh, one of the most pertinent uh, reflections on impermanence lately has been that I've been visiting a woman who's dying of cancer at a hospice. I visited with Ajahn Majiro once and uh, with Ajahn Anando another time. Ajahn Chandasiri has also been visiting this lady and uh, she's a supporter of the monastery and she has uh, womb cancer and ovary cancer which has spread all throughout her body now so that she's not digesting food anymore very well. And, uh, She's been uh, wasting away before our eyes. And all of this sounds quite depressing, but I'm happy for this lady that she's actually quite a radiant being. Having some sense of Buddhist practice, each time we've gone to visit her, she's very bright, very happy to see us, and very receptive to Dharma reflections. And when I've asked her, uh, what she intends to do when the moment of death comes. She says uh, very confidently, very happily, that she's going to let go of everything and not look back. And many people in the hospice have also commented on this woman's radiance. I remember when I was 21, I attended my elder sister's 30th birthday. And I remember at that time thinking, I was looking at my sister and I was thinking, wow, she's really old now. It's all downhill now. And uh, so a couple of weeks ago I turned 37. And I'm noticing uh, change internally and externally. It's interesting the way perceptions change as you get older. Because now when I look at really young people, they look strange. <laughs> it's like, where are the wrinkles? And when I look at myself, I look kind of ordinary. And I look at other middle-aged people. We look ordinary, it's the young people that look strange now. So perception also changes. But one thing that's certain is that uh, I am closer to dying than I was when I was 21. Coming to England, I, I've been in England only two months now. So lots of things here are new. And... Uh, I have a friend who's visiting and uh, he wanted to know from another country, his first time in England, and he wanted to know if we could do anything outside of the monastery, which might be interesting. And I asked Ajahn Semedo if we could visit some of the galleries and museums in London. And Ajahn Semedo said that would be fine. Galleries and museums are kind of okay places for monks and nuns because uh, 
people tend to be quiet and circumspect and reflective in these places, so they're quite peaceful and it feels okay to be there. So a couple of days ago I was at the National Gallery in London. I went with my friend and another monk. And a very interesting place, in fact, to contemplate impermanence. There are 2,100 paintings there, stretching over 450 years of time. And uh, I was contemplating impermanence as I was uh, looking at these paintings. And one thing, one pertinent reflection which came to me was um, of those 2,100 paintings, every single one of those painters is dead now. And every single one of those uh, subjects, every single person that the painter was painting, is also dead. And so contemplating in that way, it became a, a, a very rich contemplation of uh, impermanence. And uh, no matter how famous these people became, these famous artists became in their lifetime, or no matter how famous they came, they became after they passed away, uh, the fact is that none of them are here with us anymore. And uh, none of the people who they painted are here with us anymore. And this puts things in a certain kind of a perspective or a certain kind of a context of course, as a six-foot-four Buddhist monk walking around a city like London, sometimes people can have a interesting response to this image. You get interesting stares and sometimes sneers and sometimes comments. And uh, I just remember thinking whenever I noticed any of these reactions uh, with the perspective of impermanence and trying to focus on what is important in life, I remember thinking that there is nothing else personally that I would rather be wearing and there is no other way that I would rather be living than as a Buddhist monk. Because in this life uh, we have the opportunity to look at life very truthfully and investigate it and uh, look at things in a way which many people would find confronting. We actually have permission to do that, permission to embrace these kind of contemplations. I also last week went to the British Museum, which is an amazing museum, and also an incredible uh, opportunity for reflecting on impermanence. I was able to see their Buddha statues from Afghanistan, from uh, 1400 years ago, 1500 years ago. I don't know how many of you know that Afghanistan was once a a huge center for Buddhism, Theravada and Mahayana. And uh, of course now there isn't very much Buddhism in Afghanistan or Pakistan. So this is uh, another way, another thing to notice, to observe. Similarly, there were Buddhas from Western China 1200 years ago. And once again, not very much Buddhism in Western China now. There were Buddhas from uh, Indonesia. Indonesia was also a huge center for Buddhism for several centuries, uh, something that not that many people know. One of the most famous uh, scholar monks from Nalanda, a monk called Atisha, very famous in the Tibetan tradition, once sailed all the way to Indonesia and spent 12 years there studying with the abbot of one of the big monasteries in Indonesia because he was so famous for his compassion. He was considered to have the most compassion, the most developed compassion of all the monks in that day. And once again, there isn't very much Buddhism in Indonesia now. It's good to notice these things and just be aware of these things for several reasons. One reason, very important, is that we recognize our current opportunity is very valuable. Because when we see that uh, Buddhism, we notice that Buddhism comes to a place and it stays in that place for a while, probably depending upon the karma of the beings there, the merit of the beings. But inevitably, after a period of time, 
it degenerates and uh, passes away and uh, so far has kept moving on to new lands. We can see that Buddhism is returning to places like India and Indonesia. There's a small percentage of people practicing there now, but it is nowhere near what it was in those centers. We can see that Buddhism is coming to these, this culture, Western culture, more and more. There was another thing that struck me at the National Gallery was that in those 2,100 paintings there was not a single Buddha. And that's, maybe that seems normal to you, but I've been living in Thailand for more than 10 years, so Buddhas are everywhere, wherever you look. And it struck me, oh yes, Buddhism is new to this place. For centuries and centuries and centuries, nobody even heard the word Buddha or knew anything about what he taught. So this, uh, once again, just uh, reminded me of the preciousness of my opportunity and uh, our very good fortune and sharpened awareness around the fact that we don't know how long this opportunity will last. Uh, we don't know how successful Buddhism will be in uh, developing in these kind of cultures. But now at least we have monasteries, we have time to practice, we have a place to practice. On another level, contemplating impermanence is very helpful because it actually leads to peacefulness. So this is important to know because on a, looking at this subject on a superficial level, it can seem a little bit depressing. But it's interesting that when we simply contemplate truth with our human minds, our minds become peaceful. This is just the way the Dhamma works. When we stop resisting the truth and we simple, simply open to the fact of the truth, nature, <coughs> the mind is actually at ease with this when we look at it truthfully enough with a calm and collected mind. And a lot of the habitual grasping in the mind can drop away. And uh, most people experience this as being a tremendous relief. And uh, so we can do this in various ways. We can contemplate impermanence of uh, conditions around us, we can contemplate the changing in our bodies, and we can contemplate the death of others, we can also contemplate the inevitable death of ourselves. And when we do this as a meditation practice, our minds become calm and peaceful and clear. I've been going on some walks around the monastery, and uh, maybe something that probably a lot of English people take for granted, which isn't the case in countries like Australia. These old churches that you have in uh, most small towns with the graveyards all around the church, this doesn't happen in Australia. In Australia you can't bury bodies just anywhere, you have to have a special place, a special graveyard away from churches. And those places tend to be very big. But the churches have beautiful gardens, nice and clean, and there's no way that you could find yourself walking through gravestones and actually over the remains of beings uh, long since passed away. And so we have here actually a potential for a very rich contemplation. And uh, just walking to this little church down the hill, there are gravestones there, many hundreds of years old. And uh, they're so old, they're on angles, that, and uh, writing is washed away. And uh, we don't even know who was buried there, we don't even know how long ago they died, but we do know that somebody died a long time ago, and that the remains of their body are under the ground, if there are many remains left. And no doubt some gravestones have uh, fallen over and become buried, but one thing which I suspect is a fact about walking around that little church down the hill is that there are remains of human bodies in under the ground just about every step you take around that place. There are bodies there. So this is uh, what the Buddha recommended meditating in such places, charnel grounds, because it uh, sharpens our awareness of our own immortality, our own imminent death, and it sharpens the perception of impermanence. It would probably look a bit strange if you went down there and sat in full lotus under one of the beech trees but uh, you can sit in the, uh, in the chairs down there and just contemplate. Contemplate the fact of death and just contemplate that uh, 
beings have been dying for centuries since time immemorial and beings are currently dying and in the future beings will continue to die and when you're in a place where you know for sure that bodies have been buried this sharpens this reflection it brings it to life in a way and you can uh, we can be very sure that there are bones under the ground and you can contemplate the way that even the gravestones are bending and cracking and falling and being buried it's actually a very profound contemplation and something which I've appreciated since coming here because as I said in Australia you don't you don't see this you don't see centuries and centuries of uh, the, the history of the modern nation of Australia is only 200 years old and there weren't very many people for the first hundred years so you don't see many old buildings and you don't see many old graveyards so it's good to sometimes we take things for granted the things which are right in front of our face and it's good to refresh our perception of these things and really pay attention. It's okay, yeah, there's bodies, there's dead bodies buried on the ground around all of these churches, all of these old churches. And all of those beings, if you believe in rebirth, I do, all of those beings have since been reborn according to their karma, who knows where. thought I'd read a quote from the Dhammapada along this uh, subject. I wrote it down because I didn't want to get it wrong. I don't have a, a good memory for these things like some people do. The Buddha said, Transient are all conditioned things. When one sees this with wisdom, then one turns away from sorrow. This is the path to purity. So this is a very profound and pithy small teaching. It's, in, it's interesting that seeing impermanence is actually the path that leads away from sorrow. This is a, an interesting contemplation. Uh, my sister a few years ago had a premature baby. His name was uh, Jackson. And he lived for six months and uh, then he died and my sister was beside herself with grief and actually went a little bit mad about this experience and there are occasions in the suttas as well where other uh, women whose babies have died have gone a little bit mad uh, is it Kisa Gotami? and uh, one uh, woman whose son has died was walking around with this baby in her arms lamenting and uh, she had the good fortune to meet the Buddha and uh, the Buddha could see how beside herself uh, Kisa Gotami was with her grief and he could see that she was not yet receptive for a teaching so she asked could he help her she wanted to bring her baby back to life and he said yes I can help you he said go and uh, find go and get some mustard from a house where nobody has died and so Kisagotami was very pleased. She went off on her mission, confident that the Buddha was going to teach her. And she knocked on door after door after door saying, have you got some mustard seed? And there was, yes, we do. And uh, then she had to ask, has anyone ever died in this house? And then the person would say, oh yes, somebody died in this house. And then on to the next house, and once again, yes, somebody died in this house. And then she went through all the houses in the village and Halfway through this process she began to have some insight or at least stopped, stopped contending with nature and the truth. And she started to accept, wow, death has occurred in every house. And she went back to the Lord Buddha and uh, she said, Lord, I've been trying to find this mustard seed from a house in which no one has died. But uh, alas, every single one of these houses has had somebody in them who died. And then the Buddha gave her a teaching about the inevitability of death and the truth of impermanence. And Kisigotami was actually liberated through this insight. So this is another very important thing to understand that insights into impermanence, when deep enough, can liberate the mind from delusion completely. So when the Buddha was giving his first sermon, the Dhammachaka Sutta, the insight that Kondanyu had 
Yang Kinchi Samudaya Dhammang Sabantang Niroda Dhammanti is that all things which are of the nature to arise are of the nature to cease. And uh, he had that insight and he became a Sotapanna and he was the first enlightened being in this Buddhist dispensation with that particular insight. So I think it's the case that contemplating impermanence is playing a very important role for ripening the mind to have this kind of liberating insight. So that even if our contemplations of impermanence don't penetrate that deeply, we can feel confident that the, it's preparing the mind to have that kind of insight in the future. We don't know when, but we know that the Buddha certainly prays these kind of contemplations. And that we can see that uh, contemplating in this way does bring excellent results eventually. On a more ordinary level, but still important level, contemplating impermanence turns away from sorrow turns us away from sorrow. Coming back to the story of my sister, I think it is the case that if she had been more aware of impermanence, if she'd been aware when she was pregnant that it was possible that the fetus could die in the womb, if she was really aware of that, and, uh, and if she'd been aware when the baby was born that uh, the baby could die very young, um, she would not have suffered anywhere near as much. And so it's important for us to accept that uh, we don't know when we're going to die, we could die at any, any time, and so could those around us. When we meditate and contemplate this enough, we can save ourselves a lot of shock, a lot of grief, a lot of uh, frustration when somebody close to us does die. So there are some uh, very uh, valuable mundane and super mundane insights that can come ordinary wisdom and profound wisdom that can come from contemplating impermanence. Ajahn Chah was also famous for encouraging his disciples to contemplate things as being not certain with this phrase, my nair. Ajahn Jayasarya feels that the most correct translation of the simple phrase, my nair, in Thai is uh, not a sure thing, not a sure thing. So Ajahn Chah would train his disciples to challenge their perceptions and challenge their reactions and challenge their uh, their thoughts about the future in particular by bringing this phrase to mind, not sure, not a sure thing, so that we're always aware that things might not actually be the way we're perceiving them or might not go as we're planning and that things could change so that whatever you're thinking, you're having a reaction about something, you're just acknowledging humbly this is not a sure thing. I might not have all the facts. Uh, there might be more to this. Or we're thinking about the future. We're hoping things will go in a certain way. Right then, right when this thing is budding, sprouting, not sure, not sure. It might not go as I plan. It might change. Something might happen. And then when things do uh, change, when things don't go as uh, we planned or hoped, we understand it was never a sure thing. So I'd just like to encourage everybody. We have this very excellent opportunity. We have a very good monastery. We have very good spaces to meditate. We have instructions about how to meditate correctly. We have elders whose uh, wisdom and wise counsel we can seek. And uh, so I encourage everybody to use their opportunity while it is still here with us. I think the particular challenge of modern people is recognizing the profound value of the opportunity that we have. That these teachings are now here, the teachings of Buddhas, and translated teachings of enlightened beings, very, very good quality teachings. It's actually the case that even in Buddhist cultures, many teachings were not translated, things would degenerate into, uh, traditions would degenerate into rites and rituals, where the monks and nuns might study the meaning of the texts, 
But for centuries, many Thai people would go and listen to texts recited in Pali that they didn't actually know the meaning of. Or they'd do the chanting without knowing the meaning of it. People like Ajahn Buddhadasa and Ajahn Chah in the middle of the last century uh, started to translate these things and encouraged people to chant uh, the Pali and their native language so that they could actually contemplate the meaning. But it's actually very rare that the teachings are translated and presented us, to us in a way that we can understand. So we are actually very lucky. And uh, our challenge as modern people, I think, is focusing because uh, we live in an extraordinary time, a time of extraordinary good fortune and a time of extraordinary distraction. It's really amazing what we can do uh, on a computer, with a mobile phone, in front of a satellite TV we can really uh, waste a lot of time. And there's a lot of pressure and a lot of encouragement upon us to waste time. So another valuable thing which can come from contemplating impermanence of our uh, opportunities and of, uh, also of our lives is that it can help us focus. So um, I offer these reflections hoping to encourage you to recognize your good fortune and to help you to focus. And uh, I rejoice in all of your good fortune and I hope that we, all of our good fortune lasts for a long time and I hope that we all grow in Dhamma and develop a lot of wisdom and insight on every level. Thank you. <laughs>